Okay, so I think on, I'm not completely uh, sure if we picked one problem from each problem set last time, uh, but you know we can do something like that, or maybe if you like the problem set a lot, we can pick two from that problem set. So any suggestions for the problems? No? I was, I was thinking for problem set number seven. Okay. Uh, one or two, like one of those. Let me pull it up. Similar. One or two, number seven? Yes, problem set. They're kind of different. I mean, yeah, but they just like the potential thing, you know, like the gravity. And the other one with the rotating thing. Like they so they are so similar. That one, that one, so. Oh, you mean then three and three or four? Oh, okay. So centrifuge. Oh, I see one and two in Kitel. Oh, yeah. I see, I see. Uh yep. I I like that idea. I think. The centrifuge one is a little bit easier. Doesn't have um, the more difficult integrals. So yeah, let's do that. So problem one. Oh. All right, so this exam is going to be due um, on Sunday. Uh, let me check the date for that. Uh, March 28th. Uh, before the end of day. All right, um, so problem one is going to be similar to um, I'm going to say Kittel and Cromer to avoid confusion. Kittel and Cromer. Mm -hmm. Five point one centrifuge. Any any particular potential that you like? Maybe the potential um close to a black hole or something i'm just kidding it's gonna be a simple potential i'll think about it okay what else Alejandro, do you want to design the whole exam? No, I don't think so. <laughs> what else? Well, nobody's participating. What, what problem was number, uh, was what? Like what problem set and problem was it again? This one was, um, let me write it down with a different color. <laughs> problem set seven. Problem uh, three. Ian, your turn. Um, this is a tall glass of water. I just feel a little extra. 
pressure. Come on. <laughs> because it's just not for me. You can do it. And that's why you get a well, maybe that's why you get a better grade, right? So if other people <laughs> will participate, then maybe they will do better. But you know, the, you guys have an opportunity. Um, I was gonna say problem six, number four. Uh, problem, problem set six. Yeah. Uh, problem four. Who's this? Uh, it's me, uh, Emilio. Emilio. Uh, let me check which one that is. Um, heat capacity of photons and phonons. Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, so that will be detail and Cromer 4.12, heat capacity. So for this one, just remember that it's gonna be the derivative of the internal energy with respect to the temperature. We're gonna get some function. And, mm, It has the some concepts about the Debye temperature too. So it sounds interesting. All right. Problem three. I think we chose one from problem set five. Okay. And question one seems, question one I think is, is a good question. It's uh, Let me check standard. It out. Why do I get? Or at least some, some variation of it. Yes, let me just fight in here with some announcements. Um, problem set five, which problem? Question one. Okay. I mean, some, some variation of it doesn't have to be, of course. Entropy is an extensive quantity. Okay. <sighs> That's more on the math side. Uh, what are other extensive quantities? in addition to entropy. Volume and number of particles. This is one doesn't work. GT um, 6.7. So I'll think about a question you know, for the same problem that has a little bit of physics, but definitely uh, you can have the you know, proof that a quantity is extensive. Uh, I mean, extensive. Okay, last one. Um, problem set eight, problem two, and that one is Oh, it's a very nice one. So it gives some for a two-level system. 
So that is Kitel and Cromer 5.6. Uh, 5.6. So Gibson for a simple system. Yeah, so I might pick, you know, this one has um, might be unoccupied with energy zero or occupied by one particle in either of two states. So it might be like three states or something, you know, just to make the next simplest uh, case. All right, um, I think it's a pretty good example. Any more additions or comments or questions? And if not, I am going to take a screenshot. Oh, I get the wrong one. All right. This is for the other class. All right. Um, so, do we have any volunteers for? The study sessions. Oh, time to throw this one out, right? I keep grabbing it. All right. The cap for participation is 12 points, which is over a letter grade. It's a good backup. No volunteers? Alex, did you volunteer last time? I think you kind of un unofficially did, no? No, no, I didn't. But I don't want to because I got too much time to know. <laughs> okay. I, could, I don't know if it's allowed to volunteer again, but I can, I can volunteer. Of course. Again. Yeah, who's this? Once again, just with, this is Ian. Just a disclaimer, once again, I don't claim to be the the best that this stuff, but at least I can just sort of guide the discussion. And yes, this, this is not about knowing all the answers. It's about you know being able to, yeah, like you said, lead the discussion, right? It's like, you know what is going to be on the test. You have the, the solutions to these problems. Um, and I'm going to send you, you know, I'm going to send the, the, the host of the session the exam from last year so that you have an idea of the format. Although it's going to be this year, it's going to be a little bit less researchy than last time. You know, this just these problems. So Ian, um, any uh, any time or date? Do you um, have in mind? Wednesday at five, just because I know at five, everybody has to be mainly done with their classes or work or whatever it is. All right, awesome. Jorge, yes. If, if we're going to the, into, the, into these things, for example, if we're going to all of them, do we get all two points for each of them? We'll get yes. Oh, okay. But the cap is 12 points. Okay. So, you know, you might do it in one exam, it may take you the whole semester, but it's it's pretty doable. So what about um, uh, Alexis, are you there? I was just about to say I can host one on Friday or Saturday. Which one? Friday or Saturday? I'm not sure what's better for most people, but I can do either way if anybody wants 
else to mention. I can do, um, let's see, Friday at one. Okay, awesome. Um, thank you. Yes, thank you. Jerry, are you there? I would like to host one. Is this uh, Athens? No, this is Carolina. Ah, okay, sorry. It's difficult to do it without the face. <laughs> Okay, Carolina. Um, date and time. Thursday at maybe six. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, one more or no? Yeah, we'll say um, uh, Hermilo or uh, Jerry. You guys are doing pretty well. You should maybe uh, host a session. And I, I forgot who else is doing pretty well. Maybe they're not here. Oh, wait, Hermilo is here. He talked. Uh, I kind of wanted, I wanted to do it late in the week, but uh, Friday and then Thursday are taken. Um, what about we move Alexis to Saturday? At what time, Alexis? We'll keep it the same time. Okay. And who was that? Uh, it, it's me, Hermilo. Okay. And uh, I was thinking Friday at 1 p.m. Awesome. This is great. So I will. Um, I will send out this information and to the volunteers, I'm going to send the exam from last year. So let me just take a snapshot of this. Um, okay. So we're almost done with all the clerical stuff. Um, let's see. So the adjustments that we decided to make to the exam so we said that it was going to be four hours. Okay, so you're not going to need four hours for this exam. It's just so that you have enough time. Um, you know, you, sh you should study. Like right? if you don't study and you just try to the exam without studying, uh, you might not have enough time. But if you study, you know where, uh, you know where the main steps solving the problems are, you'll be, you'll be fine. So four hours, okay. Um, I'm going to, I hope that this doesn't fail, but it's going to be a uh, password protected. Uh, PDF, okay, uh, password is gonna be just the name of the class. Uh, this is just to um, avoid, you know, people accidentally looking at it. Uh, I think it's um, it's okay uh, if we make it open everything, uh, open internet, open. Um, Excel file, whatever. I mean, Excel um, is program or programming. These problems don't have any um, like particularly data entry um, heavy concepts, right? So take you less time than the previous one. Um, any changes that you wanna to make to, to the format of the exam? I think this is what we discussed yesterday, uh, last time, but any more suggestions?
So the deadline, Sunday, end of day, I am going to uh, post the exam. It's going to be available probably late uh, tonight or today. But you, know, you don't need to. You don't need to start it until you're you're ready. All right, give me a second here. I need to sneeze. <laughs> Oops. Uh... All right, sorry about that. I guess it's the uh, start of the spring and start of the allergy season. Um, awesome. So if, I know. I think I'm, I'm OK. Um, OK, so. Mm, let me think if there's anything else that I wanted to say. Uh, oh, yes. So, uh, there is a um, forum discussion for today, but it's not really, you don't have to read anything. You know, it's just a few questions about the course. Uh, so, you can give me some feedback for the, for the last the second half of the course. Okay, so uh, should not take you more than five or ten minutes. Uh, but it's don't don't forget about it. And I also uh, posted uh, there's a I guess the the next forum which is due uh, next Monday, and that one is a is a YouTube video, you know instead of uh, of a paper. So I want to experiment with that. It's difficult to find uh, content online that is like uh, correct uh, all of the time. You know, like most pop science videos that you watch are like ninety percent correct or something. So uh, I found uh, th you know this account on YouTube and it's it's actually really good. I'm very impressed. So check out the video. Um, check out the rest of the content. Like it's actually very impressive. Um, I finished grading your, I guess everything. Everything is graded. So you should not have uh, uh, any assignments that are not graded. If you have a zero for an assignment that you did, then please reach out to me. And the fact that I give you a zero is to let you know, oops, let you know that um, I'm supposed to have finished that part. And so, you know, reach out to me. And yeah, last thing I wanted to say is that I watch the you know the the video discussions the recordings and they were really good you know i was happy to see that uh you guys were you know kind of enjoying yourself a little actually so that was that was nice to see uh from the from you know from reading the forum uh contributions i was thinking that maybe it was kind of boring and you know Maybe it is, it doesn't have to be completely fun. It's a class after all. But you know, after watching the videos, I was like, oh, maybe this is not too bad. So, you know, I encourage, um, I have been encouraging you all the whole semester, uh, the whole term to uh, form groups. You know, I think they are more fun. Okay, uh, I think that finishes the clerical part of for today and for exam two.
All right, so now we can go into my favorite part of the course. And uh, I hope it will be your favorite part too. So chapter six. Ideal gas. And it's actually a pretty boring name for uh, such a cool chapter, okay? So the definition of an ideal gas gas of non interacting um, atoms in the limit of low concentration. And there are uh, two keywords here. First one is non interacting, and the second one is low concentration. Okay. So, what does non interacting mean? And ha have we seen so far uh, interacting uh, gases of interacting particles? We haven't seen any. We have looked at photons, uh, phonons, and um, you know, particles that the concentration is much, um, well, the, the number, how do I say it, is much smaller than the quantum concentration. So, um, the whole time we have looked at gases with these two characteristics. So whether uh, a gas is in the low concentration limit depends on its distribution function. Okay, this distribution function is usually represented by F and uh, in the last uh, lecture, we looked at some cases. Um, we had, for example, the uh, impurity in a semiconductor or the, um, you know, the fraction of a surface that was covered. And we were already using this letter F. So in general, this uh, distribution function is going to be a function of the energy of the orbital, the temperature, and the chemical potential. E is the energy of the orbital. Okay, this is also a keyword. What is an orbital? Someone with a strong chemistry background like Ian. Or any other uh, pre-med who has taken lots of chemistry. What is an orbital? Nope. 
All right, so you know, in um, like my uh, I guess the simplest concept that I have of an orbital is just in an atom. You have your nucleus in there, and then you have um, you know the s orbitals that look like a sphere the p orbitals that have like lobes um and then the d electrons look a little bit more weird but you know you also have one of them looks like that so it's where you can put your um your your electrons and this is um this is not a bad picture so we are going to take a simpler uh, definition of orbital over here, uh, even simpler than that. So it is a state. Of the Schrodinger equation. So an, an eigenvalue um, for one particle. So in the in the previous drawing, a realistic orbital, uh, you can put two electrons in each one of them, right? Because you have a spin up and a spin up and spin down. Here, for the time being, it's simpler than that. Uh, it's just like a, like an energy state, and you can put particles in them. But we're going to make an approximation. We're not going to solve the Schrodinger equation. Okay, so this is just at a conceptual level. Um, the approximation that we're making with the ideal gas is that the particles are non-interacting. And so if they are not interacting, we can put uh, several of them, you know, particle one, particle two, particle three, and so on. We can put as many as we want. Well, we'll see how many we can put in a little bit, but you can put as many as, as, uh, as you are allowed um and they are not interacting okay that means that instead of instead of solving or considering the schrodinger equation for um, a, so I guess it will be D implies one. The Schrodinger equation for an N particle system we solve N. Schrodinger equations for one particle each. Okay, so this is um, a bit simpler. What I'm describing here is that we can just draw our orbitals and put particles in them. Okay, so now um, the cool part about this, we actually had been doing this uh, kind of informally when we looked initially at the ideal gas, but we didn't make a distinction. You know, we did mention that particles uh, are indistinguishable, but we didn't make a distinction between the kinds of particles 
that you can have uh, in your in your as your ideal gas. Okay. So, any idea of what are the kinds of particles that we can put in these orbitals? Hint. Go go ahead. Like what? Hydrogen? No, 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 hydrogen. The, 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 the other end. The noble gases. Oh. Argon. Helium, argon, neon. Yes, because they are two, like their orbitals. They, they, they don't interact with other orbitals. Yeah, yeah, that, that's good reasoning. But this is more fundamental than atoms. There's two kinds, and everything in the universe is either one of them. Nope. Electrons and protons. Ah, that's close. That's close. Who's that? This Jerry. Jerry. There's uh, both electrons and protons are. They are, uh, they belong to the same kind, but it's getting closer. Uh, electrons do not have any more structure, you know, as far as we know. Uh, protons do. Protons are made out of quarks. Um, anything, it, it, you know, electron, you almost got it there. One more attempt. Exactly. Okay, so the two kinds of particles that exist are fermions and bosons. So bosons have integral spin. Fermions have uh, half integer spin. Okay. Everything, every particle that exists in the universe um, that includes matter and radiation, every particle is, uh, where's my, oh, is this one. Uh, it's either a fermion or a boson. So examples of bosons, probably the main one is a photon. A photon is a boson. And another famous one is the Higgs boson, which was uh, detected recently, relatively recently. Uh, fermions include um, electrons and uh, protons and quarks. The main difference between them, as we will see in a little bit, is that electron uh, fermions, they are subject to the Pauli exclusion principle. You cannot put two of them in the same quantum state. Bosons don't have that issue. You can put as many as you want in the same quantum state. So the fact that you can touch things, so the, 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 the volume property of matter is due to the Pauli exclusion principle. If we did not have fermions in the universe, then volume will not exist. This is because you know, they cannot occupy the same quantum state, so they will tend to move to higher energy states. When you try to, you know, when I'm, I'm touching here, my electrons, the electrons of uh, the whiteboard, 
you know, they don't like each other, so they have a finite space that they take. So this is, you know, pretty, pretty important for the universe, and I guess pretty important for us mainly. So consider a system. of n non-interacting identical by identical i mean indistinguishable particles The wave function of the system is going to be given by this. The approximation that we are making, because they are non interacting, is that we can separate this wave function. So it's going to be the wave function of one particle and the wave function another particle, the wave function of the nth particle. So, you know, if they interact, then this is a very, um, it's, a, it's a pretty complicated wave function. But if they don't interact, it's much more, um, it's much simpler. Okay. So now let's focus on two of these particles. And this is uh, general, but we can focus just on two. So it's going to be the wave function of um, these two particles. And if the particles are indistinguishable, then we can switch them, right? We can exchange them. And what we actually measure in an experiment is not the wave function, is the square of the wave function. So if they are indistinguishable, this must be true. But now I have two options, two, two ways to make that uh, hold. The first option is mm. I'm going to put it over here because I don't have much space. And the wave function is just equal to the other one. But the second option is that the wave function is equal to the negative of the original one. Okay, both of these make the previous uh, equation hold. So, you know, just a very simple uh, representation of how this might look like. And you might have your two particles centered here and you know, your wave function maybe looks kind of like that. Over here, uh, and you know they're they're equal, so uh, they look the same. This is exaggerated; they're the same uh, when you exchange them. But here, maybe this one looks a 
like this. So when you exchange it, the wave function is gonna look like that. When you take the square of these, you know, both are going to look the same. So the, the previous equation, the first equation holds. This is called a symmetric wave function. This is running out of steam. And this is the uh, anti-symmetric. wave function. Had you seen this before in any class, like modern physics? And if no, it's okay. Just wanna, just wondering. All right. Um, yes, someone was going to answer. Okay. Well, but you're familiar with the concept of a wave function, right? Yes, sir. Okay, good. So these are your two options. Um, and as I mentioned, these holds even when you have more particles. So you, can, you may have the wave function of the whole thing. You exchange two of them. So this is how that part is going to look like. Okay. So there are two kinds of wave functions. Symmetric and anti-symmetric. And the symmetric ones, uh, they are associated with bosons and the anti-symmetric with fermions. Okay, so now, We know what happens when we exchange them. And that is, we can do that because remember they are indistinguishable. So the indistinguishability aspect of it is critical to, to the universe, to the physics that we know. So now consider um, two identical particles. We can call them one and two. And we are going to put them in two different orbitals. And remember that orbitals are just like you know, places with different energies that we can put our, our particles in. So these two orbitals are A and B. Okay. So if particle one is in orbital A and particle two is in orbital B, then the wave function is gonna be wave function of orbital A, particle in position, particle one in the position, and wave function of B, particle two. If we have the case in which particle, um, two is in A and one is in B, then the wave function is gonna be this.
right? So it's the same, but we switch these uh, x1 and x2. Can we switch them? Yes, because they are indistinguishable. There is nothing that makes one or two more likely than the other. And they're, they're both uh, you know, possibilities. So if you have two weight functions, the general weight function is going to be a superposition of both. It's one of the properties of the differential equation um, when the Schrodinger equation is a differential equation. So, um, let me put it over here. So there are two options. The first one I'm gonna call S for symmetric is going to be one over the square root of two because you always have to normalize it and you're gonna have two of them that are squared. Uh, we function okay this is one solution but the other one let's call anti-symmetric is going to be Kind of the same, except that now you have a negative sign instead of a positive. And because it is squared, it still um, uh, holds with the uh, with the equation that you know, the, the the square is equal. The constraint. Okay. So if we exchange x1 and x2, then in the symmetric case, we get. What do you mean by x1 and x2? Is it like the position? Yeah. So the wave function is a function of the position, right? So you're gonna have uh, a wave. So a, a, a probability if you take the square of where the particle is, right? And that probability depends on the position. So the probability that, you know, an electron that is in your body is in your body is pretty high. Uh, but there's also, you know, kind of a chance because it is a wave that it is outside of your body. So it depends on the on the position. So x1 and x2 are the two different particles. You can switch them because they are indistinguishable. And so we're assuming that it's a one-dimensional thing because it just has one x. This is a one a one-dimensional case, but okay. it works in three dimensions. You know, if you had x1, y1, and z1. So we're going to switch, exchange uh, x1 and x2. So now this one is gonna look uh, a x2, b x1, a x1, and b x2, yeah, and this one, is the same as this one, okay? So if the wave function is symmetric, then when you exchange them, you 
you get the same. So when you have orbitals, you still have the same phenomenon, right? Yeah. Um, before we didn't put orbitals, so we're in the same orbitals in the same box. Now they are in different boxes, you still get the same phenomenon. And um, the anti symmetric, I'm going to put it here. Um, this is going to be a negative. So in that case, we can take, we can put the negative out here. Um, this one is going to become a positive. This one is going to become a negative. And now you have, this one is this one. This one is this one, but you have the negative outside. Okay, so in the anti-symmetric case, the weight function is negative, negative of the original one. Okay. So um, this one, so the case of the boson is symmetric under exchange. And the fermion is anti-symmetric under exchange. So we have the same phenomenon. Okay. So let's do one more experiment. put both particles in the same orbital in A. If the function is symmetric, it's going to be Okay, so that is, uh, or should I hate this alarm? I cannot remove it from my phone, I don't know why. All right. Um, so this is equal to um, it's a weird way to write it. Well, I guess we have the screw root in there. So you have this one twice. But in the anti symmetric case, this one is negative. And what do you get here? So you can't put 
to anti-symmetric particles in the same orbital. Why not? Well, because you cannot destroy matter, just, well, you destroy wave functions just like that. So, so that this is visible, right? Is it the poly? Exactly. So, this is a Pauli exclusion principle. So Pauli discovered it in uh, 1925, I think. So and this is why the atom has a, a structure, an electronic structure. That's why you can touch things. That's why the property of volume exists. You know, things have volume. Uh, it is, you know, as fundamental as you can get. And it comes just from symmetry. Like you cannot exchange anti-symmetric particles because then they don't exist and you cannot destroy matter like that. So the Pauli exclusion principle only uh, applies to fermions. Okay, so if you look at a, a real atom, um, you can actually put two electrons per orbital. That's because spin, which um, you know, we're, we're ignoring uh, with our orbital here, we're saying that we can just, um, that it has only one quantum number. Uh, in, in real atoms, you can put up and down. Um, and that's, you know, that's generally true. You're going to be able to, if they have different spin, you can put them like that. So pretty cool. What do you guys think? So um, if you take the expectation value of the distance between particles, if you have uh, two symmetric wave functions, so two bosons, uh, the expectation value is shorter than if you have indistinguishable particles. I mean, distinguishable particles, okay? So uh, bosons attract slightly. If you have fermions, the expectation value of the position is going to be a little bit further away than if the particles were distinguishable. So fermions feel a push against each other. This is kind of like a force, but it's not a force because it doesn't have a force carrier. It's just a, it's a purely quantum mechanical interaction. Um, this is called the uh, exchange interaction. It was discovered independently by uh, Dirac and Heisenberg in 26. Okay. Yes. So like I was watching this thing, the particle physics and they have, they have like this the graviton. Yeah. So that's like a boson, right? Because it attracts. Yes, uh, that's that's gonna be tough, you know. So you will assume, and I, I think it's reasonable to assume that the graviton exists. But remember that if in order to uh, be created by gravitons, gravity has to be a quantum mechanical. 
and there is no quantum mechanical theory of gravity. You know, so, and the boson, if it does exist, is going to be like ridiculously difficult to detect. I mean, we're happy, you know, they're pretty lucky that we can detect gravitational waves, but the graviton is a huge, very tall order. Okay, so the results of quantum theory, so you, know, you don't need to uh, remember all these wave functions, I just wanted to show you where things come from. But uh, the, the results that we're gonna be working with in the class are on page uh, 152 of Kittel. First one is an orbital um, can be occupied. by any integral number, and you know, it's quite a size, so it's integral, any integral number of bosons, okay? Bosons, you can put as many as you want, um, including zero. Fermions an orbital can be occupied by either zero or one fermions. And again, orbital, we use it in the sense of a set of quantum numbers. So very different, very different uh, particles. So this is the symmetric case or a symmetric particles with symmetric wave function. These are uh, anti-symmetric wave function. Okay. So just very quickly, I wanted to give you some examples of these particles. Um, so fermions with no known substructure. Spin one half. Leptons. There are two kinds of leptons charged and neutral. The charged leptons are the electron, the muon and the tau. And they each have an anti. So there, there's also an anti-electron, anti-muon, and anti-tau. And the neutral are the electron neutrino, the muon neutrino, and the tau neutrino. Each of these particles has spin one half. The other fermions with no known substructure are quarks. So they're divided in two families, the up quarks and the down quarks. And the most famous up quark is the up quark. But there's also charm and top. The down are down. Um, strange and uh, um, bottom. 
And each one of these has an anti-particle. So anti-up, anti-charm, uh, anti-top. What is the, the difference um, between the electron, the muon, and the tau? The charge is the same. Uh, the mass is different. And you know, all these particles have half-lives, they decay. So muon and tau, they're gonna be pretty heavy, so they decay pretty quickly into like electrons and probably other stuff. Um, neutrinos, they're a little weird. Um, they all have the same mass. Um, and they have a different quantum number. I think it's called the chirality or something like that. Getting out of my area of expertise here. Um, up and down, they all have the same charge. Uh, they have different mass. The up charm and top. And so these ones you know, are going to be more difficult to find. You have to put them together in some particle for them to not decay right away. Uh, so bosons, oops, with no known substructure, spin one, um, they're just all the charge carry, um, the force carriers. So the photon is the carrier of electromagnetic force. The gluon is a carrier of a strong force and the um, W and Z are the carriers of weak force. So um, Alejandro, I guess the graviton, if it exists, will probably be here. But you know, I, I don't think the graviton is part, the graviton is part of the standard model, just because you wanted to unify the theory of quantum gravity. But these are well established. If they are a force. Uh, if it is a force, then it has a force carrier. Force carriers are bosons. So you can put as many as you want in that state. And that's why you can have a pretty strong um, electromagnetic or strong or the weak force um, interaction. And the other one, uh, it's zero spin is the Higgs boson. What the Higgs boson does is um, create some sort of resistance to leptons. And so the Higgs boson gives leptons, that is, you know, electrons, muons. Um, it gives uh, fermions their, their mass. The mass of um, like uh, the neutron and the proton it actually comes from the, the strong force. All right, so you have a very strong potential. You have your quarks over here to create a, a proton. And the potential is really large um, and um, uh, energy and mass are equivalent. So if the potential is large, you're gonna have a hard trouble moving it. So that's where mass comes from. And finally, you can combine fermions uh, and bosons, and they will create different things. So the main thing that they create, I guess, for our for purposes of our existence. So fermions with known. 
structure are um, so quarks they are bound by the strong force they uh, are bound in triplets okay so um, the most common ones are the up quark and the down quark. The up quark has um, spin one half, of course. And the charge is two thirds of uh, the charge of an electron. The down also has spin one half and has charge negative one third of an electron. So if you put two up quarks and one down quark together, what do you get? Up, up, down. The spin here, one half and one half, they're going to anti align, so kind of cancel out. But then you still have the down. So it's going to have spin one half. What about the charge? Two thirds plus two thirds minus one third. That's three thirds. Charge is one. Huh? This is a proton. So proton is a combination of three fermions. And it ends up being a fermion because there's one unaligned spin. If you do the um, the other one, the other combination, so one up and two down, then the spin, the down spins are going to anti-align, cancel each other, but you still have the unpaired U. So the spin is one half, but now the charge is gonna be two thirds minus one third minus one third, that's equal to zero thirds. So charge is zero. And what is that? Is it an neutron? Exactly. Okay. So um, things that have three quarks are called baryons. So both neutrons and protons are baryons. And if you have heard of baryonic matter, well, that's matter that is that has neutrons and protons in it. That's most of the matter in the universe. Most of the matter is created by the strong force when it binds these three fermions. Um, and both the, because you can, because you add them, both the neutron and the proton have spin one half. So they are fermions. You cannot put two of them in the same state. That's why you cannot put two protons together. They have to occupy some space. And so you have volume in the nucleus. Um, all right, uh, finally, um, well, I'm just going to mention the last one I had, uh, deuterium also, but the another important one is the boson. I mean, the, a composite uh, boson is
um, the nucleus of a helium-4 atom, which is called an alpha particle. So the alpha particle has two protons, two neutrons. So it has up, up, down, up, down, down. The spin, oh wait, then you have two of these. The total spin is gonna be zero. Okay, so it is a boson. The, these ones are going to anti-align, anti-align, and then you have this one, this one anti-align, this one, this one anti-align, spin zero. Um, that means that you can put as many alpha particles as you want in the same state. So if you decrease the temperature a lot, and you force all the particles to be in the ground state, you get things like superfluidity, right? So helium-4 is a superfluid at low temperatures and it's because it is, a, it is a boson. Same thing with superconductivity. You have the Cooper pairs. Um, it's an electron phonon interaction. The electrons and the phonons create a boson and the charge can move without resistance. They can all be in the same ground state. So a lot of interesting physics and we're gonna look at some of it. All right, I'm gonna stop recording here. <laughs>